And so the next stage of the process would be to assemble these traps or wedges using picture frames and pine wood with normal bed sheet breathable clothing and acoustic sheets. So I will start with an initial prototype design, then proceed to fabricate the final assembly design. So first select the screw and the drill bit that will be utilized in linking or assembling two picture frames together. Ensure that your screw doesn't go beyond the depth or thickness of the picture frame. And also ensure that you mask your drill bit with the length of the screw so that when you drill through your picture frame, it doesn't exit on the other side. The angled bracket will provide the desired robustness for both of them picture frames that will be utilized to build the base trap build. Measure the length of your frame you know, and decide where you'd want to locate your angle bracket. You can decide to locate it at the mid center, at the very top, or, you know, further down. Two or three brackets adjoining both picture frames should be sufficient enough, as you want them brackets to be evenly distributed. Once sorted, mark out them positions at the mid center or further to the left or right of the picture frame length. And once we've sorted out the required drilling depth and drilling location, we can proceed to drill. Holes for the installation of the angled bracket. An angled bracket will be used to secure both frames together. This will provide the basic frame structure or the building block for the base strap. Then subsequently, we select the piece to screw bit to screw down the anchor, screw into the wood or picture frame, push the knob down at the trigger and vary the speed to one on the drill, which would be used to screw down the anchor onto the picture frames. Then subsequently repeat and reproduce the process for other anchor positions on both picture frames. This will form the basic building frame for how the rock wall sits on the sides of the base trap. We can rework or remodify the basic building frame um, with thicker pine wood of varying lengths. This will be exemplified at a later stage. At this stage, we're just showing how you can improvise if you're working on a budget and haven't got access to building materials. Utilization of pine wood frames would mean a more sturdier frame, okay? Suffice to say, utilization of picture frames just about does the job, but you know, if you want, you know, a frame that's sturdily built, you could utilize pine wood, you know, of, of greater thickness. The next step of the process would be to measure, mark out, cut, assemble and install both the top and the bottom bays. Here I have marked out the picture back board covering that was retrieved from a picture frame. Having marked it up in various positions, the next step would be to cut out the marked positions. These cut out pieces will form the top and bottom bays pieces of the base trap building blocks. Once I've cut out all the pieces, I will replicate the drilling process for all them pieces onto the top and base of the base trap, okay? Then subsequently, replicate the screw down process for the top and bottom base of the base traps. Using the base of the base trap, cut out several layers or stratas of rock wool that will be subsequently inserted or embedded into the base trap, okay? One on top of each other. Then use the bed sheet breathable clothing to cover up the base trap, okay? And then subsequently use a staple gun to secure the clothing onto the base trap frame. Now that we've been able to work out the bill of materials to build the replica base trap model, we can remodify this process by actually using pine wood and plywood at a subsequent stage where the cutting of the top and bottom base frame would be more refined or aesthetically pleasing. 
and the side frames of the base trap more steadier with increased thickness to build a more steadier base trap which I will be showing at a later stage which will also encompass the acoustic fabric of better quality and so lastly I will be installing the breathable clothing with a staple gun onto the picture frame and if the pins are in flush you know you can make them flush with a hammer and also make sure that you're driving you know the pins into the wood frame as opposed to the clothing and so here you have an assembly of the base traps and acoustic panels that have been fabricated or built. This assembly stage shows you how to build original equipment base traps. Suffice to say, in this video, I will be commissioning you know, the initial prototype or the conceptualized idea into an OE build. Firstly, I will be validating and reviewing the design, okay? The base trap that will be constructed will be sat from the floor up to the ceiling and will extend from both right-angled side and corner walls. This will enable the working out of how many pine woods we need as well as how many hardwood, plywood um, I will need, okay? The pine wood will form the pillar structure, whereas the hardwood plywood will form the top and the bottom base of the base trap. So here I will be using a circular saw to split a 4 feet by 2 feet hardwood plywood into 8 sections. And that is because a build of 4 base traps requires 8 diagonally cut hardwood plywood as you can see here. Y is the hypotenuse which is about 2.828 feet and if you split that into two you get the width or depth spread which is X and that equals to 1.414 feet okay. And so basically we've worked out that the four feet by two feet hardwood plywood and board will give us eight base straps, we're not going to have any waste and we've identified that the length of spread of the base trap is about two feet and the width or depth of spread of the base trap is about 1.414 feet. This will enable us to establish our bill of materials and ensure that you know parts are not surplus to requirements okay. It's important to work out your bill of materials to prevent waste and to prevent line stops due to shortage of materials, okay? The hardwood plywood length is about 1220 millimeter, its breadth 610 millimeter and its thickness or depth 9 millimeter, which equates to about um, 4 feet by 2 feet with respect to its length and breadth and 0 0.02 feet with respect to its depth. So the next step of the process would be to line up the cotton mat diagonally you know across the hardwood plywood and trace out the cotton line then subsequently you know flip the cotton mat around and trace out the other cotton line that's opposite you know the one that was previously drawn until we get four sections okay the next step of the process would be to map out the entire you know assembly test process so that we can see at first glance or you know skimming through if we've got you know any parts and shortages or if there is any non-conformance you know at an early stage you know to save on time quality and cost and to ensure you know a first time pass yield that you know the fabrication or the build of the base trap you know passes the first time as opposed to you know making reworks and alterations um, to achieve our, our goal okay so here I have modelled, you know, the pine wood onto the hardwood plywood and we've got pine wood, you know, of varying length, you know, the long and short, you know, to provide reinforcements for the base trap housing structure. And if we glide through the model's panoramic view, you can see how the base trap um, would look like on the outside and on the inside as well, okay. And here I've reinforced this angled bit that would sit into the wall, okay, with two pine woods, which will be assembled at right angles. 
so that the base trap housing fits perfectly into the right angled walls which is the position where it will seat in. The erection of the housing structure as shown in the model will be replicated for other base trap hardwood plywood sections. So I will erect more pine wood on you know other hardwood plywood sections. Three of the base traps will have the same height, whilst one of the base trap would have a slightly um, longer height and when compared with the other three base trap, and that's because I will want it to, you know, to cover the full spectrum um, height um, up from the floor to the ceiling. And if you visually inspect or measure the pine wood, it's got a thickness of one inch or 1.4 inches, depending on which of the pine wood housing structure you're looking at. Which invariably means that if you use a thicker screw or a screw with a larger diameter, you know, it could result to splitting off the pine wood. So we're going to be looking for a thin screw and I've selected the 60 mil in length and four mil in diameter screws, which equates to about um, 2.375 inches in length screw. This 4mm in diameter and 60mm um, length screw is quite fit for purpose as it's got a short tooth that prevents splitting. You know it's quite thin, it will go through the pine wood without splitting the pine wood. If you use um, a larger screw that could split you know the pine wood and you know pilot drill if you must before opening up the hole to you know your 4mm um, diameter okay but you know you can see we've got different lengths here you know one of the pine wood is is you know longer than the other pine wood in terms of you know the height and that's because on final assembly when we stack each base trap on top of each other we want you know all of the base traps you know to catch up to the ceiling to accumulate up to the ceiling okay you know pretty much compound to meet or achieve the ceiling height and like I said previously, we're going to attach or fit the diagonally cut hardwood plywood, you know, onto the top of the um, housing and pine wood structure, as well as the base. So the process would be, you know, cut the hardwood plywood into sections using a secular saw, and then subsequently pilot drill the pine wood with the drill bit, then, you know, open up the hole and then screw the diagonally cut sections, you know, onto the top and base of the housing structure of the um, base trap. Here we've got like a four mil in diameter screw, which is 60 mil in length and has got like a sort tooth to prevent splitting, which is illustrated in the, in the diagram as shown. And so, as earlier highlighted, you know, the thickness or depth of your pine wood structure or you know housing is quite thin then by you know by all means get a thinner screw so that when you screw it in through the um, um, piloted holes or the op opened up final hole sizes it doesn't result to splitting off the um, pine wood okay and if you visually inspect the screw you can see that the top side of the screw hasn't got thread you know on its upper side um, which means that when you're opening up the, the piloted holes to its final size, make sure that you drill right through, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get, you know, the screw in when you're screwing it down, okay? So just make sure that you carry out due diligence, you know exactly what you're doing, and so that you're not um, damaging your wood, okay? And, you know, on visual inspection, just as shown on the diagram, it's got, you know, the sort tooth that prevents splitting. And if I lay the screw side by side on the skill, you can actually see that it's 60 mil in length. So you can also confirm it that way if you haven't got like um, a meter rule, okay, or a measuring tape. And lastly, the screw's caveat says, you know, when tuck tightening the screw, you utilize a PZ2 screw bit, okay. The next step of the process would be to diagonally cut the hardwood plywood in two sections using a secular saw. You know, first, you know, you clamp the hardwood plywood, you know, onto your workbench or in this case, an improvised um, rack. And then subsequently, attach your dust extraction adapter to your secular saw and then your vacuum hose, you know, attach that to your 
um, flexi waist straight coupling okay which will help in channeling a lot of the throwing object debris into your vacuum okay and like i said initially you know clamp you know the um, hardwood plywood board into position you know prior to um, using the secular saw and once the hose coupling and the dust extraction have been securely attached to the secular saw then you can cut you know the hardwood plywood diagonally you know through the cutting line click on the link in the description you know if you want something more incisive on how to use the secular saw and how to set it up and how to cut you know your hardwood plywood diagonally you know or sectionally okay you know how to select your blades how to get quality cuts and whatnot okay if you want something more incisive click on the link in, in the description and so as highlighted in the description link um, I have deployed the use of a rack to uh, make diagonal cuts. You don't have to do this. You can deploy the um, use of a table saw, and that's because I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, there is no movement. You know, it's kind of like freehand um, cutting, you know, through the cutting lines on the um, hardwood plywood board. But if you haven't got a table saw and your workbench, you know, it's an impediment to making diagonal cuts, then you might as well give this a go, but just make sure that your G clamps are adequately secure where they secure or latch onto the hardwood plywood board make sure you're not impressing your weight you know on the table saw and the hardwood plywood and also make sure that your rack you know is there isn't any movement you know with regards to your rack when you're using the secular saw you know to make diagonal cuts through the cutting lines or you know when your blade starts to get traction you know on the plywood hardwood board so make sure that there isn't any movement you know prior to cutting through the hardwood plywood okay and also for quality cuts, make sure that you select quality blades. We haven't used the appropriate blade in this um, instance. And, you know, click on the link in the description to see why this isn't, this isn't the appropriate um, blade. The blade just about does a good job with respect to, you know, getting fine quality cuts, you know, um, around the edges of the hardwood plywood. And why it's important to have that. And that's because you'd be having your acoustic fabric, you know, around the perimeter of the um, the top and bottom hardwood plywood and baseboards. OK, so here we've replicated the process. We've got eight hardwood plywood um, diagonal um, section boards that have been cut. And um, we've got, you know, the long and short, you know, um, pine woods that would be used to fabricate or to um, assemble the structure of the base traps. So carry out due diligence, make sure you measure the height and um, from your floor to the ceiling and you know just kind of work out you know the height of the the base traps that you will be um fabricating or you you will be cut into size okay you might want to use a combination blade or a special purpose blade you know to cut hardwood plywood and boards as the venue sheets that are laid on top of each other you know if you've got rough edges you know by all means you know sandpaper to smoothen it out you know with a coarse sandpaper or with a with a fine sandpaper wherever applicable and if you're not willing to go ahead with the concession, you could, you know, draw another cotton line, you know, don't take too much off the edges and, you know, use your circular blade, you know, to, to cut off, you know, the edges where appropriate, okay? But just make sure that, um, you know, for each um, base trap that, you know, the dimensions of the measurements, they tally with each other. So at this stage, it's imperative that you validate the dimensions of the pine wood. You know, make sure that, you know, the base traps that are at the same height have got exactly the same dimensions um, in their structures. Suffice to say, make sure that the pine woods are cut to size with respect to their dimensions. Here, I have decided to have three base traps of the same height and one outstanding base trap of a different height. So I will be mapping them out so that I make sure that certain parts go where they are required and that I do not mismatch um, the parts, okay? I don't want to mix them up. So I'll map it out, then begin to assemble each component um, gradually from their respective positions in situ. And also use this opportunity to make sure that all the accessories, all the components that will be used um, in assembling the base traps are 
um, within the work area, okay, but they're not causing any obstructions, any slipping trips, okay, so that all the base traps are fabricated just in time and there isn't any line to stop with regards to how readily available the base traps are uh, manufactured or assembled. And now that we've validated and accounted for all the parts in the bill of materials, we can actually proceed to build the base traps from lower level to top level where we finally put on the acoustic fabric. And if we have any buffer stock or any extra pine wood components that we can reinforce, you know, the unidentical um, base trap with it, okay? So just bear that in mind that the housing structure isn't set in stone you know at very bare, bare minimum you know this is what we have but we can only, always reinforce you know the structure where necessary prior to pilot drilling ensure that the drill bits profile is slightly smaller than the diameter of the screw which is four mil and here you can see that the thread of the screw protrudes slightly more outwards than the drill bit that ensures um, a tight fit okay when we talk tight and the screw downwards so the first step of the process would be to pilot drill you know holes between you know pine woods vary the drill speed to two for drilling and ensure that you know whilst you're drilling you know through the pine wood that you drill all the way through when you're pilot drilling and that's because the top part of the screw hasn't got any thread that would enable you to top tighten the 4mm diameter screw more easily at a later stage. Ensure that you've got like a scrap material, you know, underneath the pine wood so that it doesn't damage your flooring, okay? That is if you're not using your workbench to pilot drill your pine wood, okay? So what I will be doing here essentially is to pilot drill, you know, the pine wood um, frame structure or the pillars okay then subsequently tuck tight in you know the four mil screw and um, through you know the perforated holes in them pine woods you know just to give it some traction you know when we're screwing screwing both or assembling both um, pine wood frame structures together I'll show you what I mean here otherwise if you just you know pilot drill and you're trying to screw um, the screw directly from one pine wood to the other you may have difficulty you know in top tightening the screw all the way down so when you pilot drill your pine wood you know individually or discreetly or you know screw down the screw on standalone pine woods before you attempt to assemble you know both pine woods together and also you can also infuse some gorilla glue in between both pine woods to provide a more steadier and um, built frame essentially to provide the solid rigid connection that we're looking for for the housing pillar structure in this process step if you're assembling two pine woods with you know a larger width um, you might as well use a long screw you know like the four mil screw but if you're assembling the diagonal cut hardwood plywood onto the pine wood you need a smaller screw okay and that's because the hardwood plywood's and thickness or depth isn't as thick as that of the pipe of two pine woods being assembled together I'll show you what I mean at a later stage but at this stage we're going to be using the thin 4 mil diameter and 60 mil long thin screw you know to assemble pine woods together you can see here that I'm screwing you know the screw through the pine wood and it's not splintered okay and you can see that I am assembling you know the pine wood onto the other pine wood frame and because I had initially run you know the screw through both pine woods it's it's a lot easier to talk tight in both and um, pine woods together and why I'm, I'm having to do this is to avoid any splintering to enable good traction when talk tightening the screw th through both pine woods so that I do not compromise on time quality and cost this process will be replicated throughout the entire assembly process of the pine wood housing pillar structure and you can see what we discussed earlier so i've driven the screw previously to the bottom pine wood okay taking the screw out and i'm you know assembling you know the top part of the pine wood um, structure onto the lower level and pine wood that sat on the workbench or clamped to the workbench 
This makes it easier to top tighten the screw through the piloted hole as the top part of the screw hasn't got any threading on it. The next step of the process would be to assemble the diagonally cut sectioned hardwood plywood onto the already assembled pine wood housing pillar structure. Here you don't need to top tighten with the 60mm length screw and that's because the plywood hardwood depth is about 9mm so 60mm is way too deep in okay but you can get away with it but you know to avoid splintering by all means use a shorter screw and you would see in all that you know base traps that have replicated the process with a mismatch of screws so I haven't just used long screws Okay, I've also used um, shot as screws and because um, I do not require um, a 60 mil um, depth to secure the hardwood plywood base onto the pine wood structures. So at this stage, I am replicating the entire assembly of the housing structure and base structure. Just to jog your memory, you know, sort of like a recap, but I wouldn't be going into, you know, showing all of the assembly of all of the bays. Um, traps because that would just you know take take time but you do get the hang of it don't you but I will be showing you a 2d or somewhat panoramic view of you know the assembled housing frame structure and base structure okay so here I have replicated the process and assembled all the housing frame structures to them plywood bases and here you can see the unidentical base trap it's got a different height and only three pillars supporting the housing frame, you know, which is subject to reinforcements. Whilst the other three housings are identical, you know, with a number of pillars supporting, you know, both the top and bottom and plywood structures. So here I will be visually inspecting the top level assembled housing structure with their respective bases to make sure they are as per the design review. OK, and so far there's been no bottlenecks, concessions or non-conformance to see how to overcome the rework of the diagonally cut, you know, plywood bases with respect to kickbacks or binding when using the circular saw. Click on the link in the description to, to get something more incisive with respect to how to use circular saws to cut hardwood plywood. And you can see just by visual inspecting the screw heads that have been used to tuck tighten the hardwood plywood sectionally or diagonally cut um, boards onto the housing frame that they have different colors and that that's because some screws are shorter than you know the four mil in diameter and 60 mil in length screw that was used initially to um couple pine wood together and like i said the plywood is only about nine mil thick so i definitely needed shorter screws to couple it onto the pine wood structure and so i used shorter screws okay just saves the pine wood from splintering and you know driving the screws to further in when you don't need to and here you can see where I've reinforced the unidentical base trap with more pine wood you know on the sides this would make it more sturdier okay helps with anti-tipping with respect to the slightly more increased weight and also helps you know the acoustic fabric latch onto the housing frame structure you know flush flush wise as you would want to minimize or prevent the rock wool or acoustic material from protruding through the acoustic fabric when you latch the acoustic dampening fabric flush over the housing frame and the diagonally cut plywood hardwood board basis. And as you can see here, the reinforced sidewood frame would give the acoustic fabric a more uniform flush look as opposed to an uneven look okay and if you can when necessary by all means install the side wood pine wood frames as it, it will not just help with the aesthetic look of the acoustic fabric but it will also help keep the rock wall um, in check or in place so that it doesn't you know just fall off um, relatively easily from the top or bottom okay if you're diagonally cut base plywood boards have got rough edges you could sandpaper the edges of the triangular hardwood plywood board with coarse or fine sandpaper 
depending on the degree of fineness or smoothness that you're trying to achieve. And if you also zoom out on the hardwood plywood board, you will notice that, you know, certain edges are receding on the inside. And that's because the hardwood plywood sectionally cut diagonal boards um, were freehand cut with the use of a circular saw. They're pretty much just cut through a cutting line. So there will be a marginal degree um, of human error when fabricating or cutting the hardwood plywood base boards. The pine wood side panel reinforcements helps to accommodate this deviation by providing a seamless uniform look when the acoustic dampening fabric latches on to the base trap assembly. The next stage of the assembly process is to insert and stack rock wool wedges on top of each other from the floor of the bottom base hardwood plywood to the ceiling of the top base hardwood plywood whilst ensuring that it is compact all through its clearance height. This would help prevent movement or play when we cover the housing structure with the acoustic dampening fabric. One of the advantages of using rock wool is that it's quite versatile. You can cut it to any shape or size that you want, okay? In this case, I've made triangular shapes, okay, to fit right into the base traps. And as you can see, with the aid of a Stanley knife, I can cut out the triangular pristine shape, okay? This is just for demonstration purposes, okay? And so this process has been replicated for all of the other base traps. And if I get you a panoramic view or 2D view, of the filled in or stacked um, base traps with rock wool. You can see that it's quite compact. It's all been stacked in all of the housing structure frames and there is little play of movement in them housing frame structures. Also make sure that the rock wool isn't protruding from any of the three sides of the housing frame structure so that they don't bulge from the acoustic fabric which will be fitted on at a later stage. Here, I will be using acoustic pads and the remnants of towels, advanced acoustic base trap corner fields and rock wool fields, okay? The advanced acoustic base trap corner field remnants are embedded in the grey towel and sealed off with industrial or fabric glue, whilst the rock wool remnants are embedded in the white towel pieces and sealed off with a fabric transparent glue, okay? So, you don't always have to discard leftover pieces, you can always put them to good use, okay? And lastly, you know, I've got acoustic pads that have been flipped over on each other and stacked in the base trap frame structure. As standalones, these acoustic pads may help slightly with reflections, with mid-range and high frequencies, but not particularly low frequencies, okay? But when stacked on top of each other with towels, you know, acoustic base trap remnants and rock wool, they might, you know, be quite effective um, with regards to reflections or low frequencies in a base trap. If you have to use a combination of acoustic material to make sure they are compact, you stack them on top of each other and you use the remnants of the acoustic dampening fabric to provide leverage so that it doesn't bulge out from your final um, covering, okay? If you don't have access to rock wool, you could do this. My first preference would be rock wool, but if you haven't, you could use the remnants, the all to do a cost effective job, okay? Or just stack wedges on top of each other and that could do the job as well. You know, the more you get them into your room, you know, the more it helps with soundproofing. The final step of the assembly stage process would be to cover both the identical and unidentical bay strap with the acoustic dampening fabric. Base traps do not just absorb the low end frequencies in your studio or room, they also help to absorb or better define the low frequency making them easier to control and recognise, which in turn helps to achieve better results in your recordings. The first step of the sealing off process would be to cut the acoustic dampening fabric in squares or rectangles. Suffice to say, first cut the fabric length with respect to the perimeter of the housing frame and then subsequently cut the fabric breadth with respect to the height of the housing frame. This will ensure that the cut fabric secures or seals off the entire housing pillar structure. 
you could deploy the use of a permanent marker and a cutting mat so that your cutting line is quite visible on the fabric but make sure that you're marking the fabric on the underside or the back of the dampening fabric and as you can see I'm running the scissors through the cotton line and you know it's a quite cost effective way of saving on material and how do you deduce you know the perimeter I just get your measuring tape it's quite flexible around the three pillar supports you know on the um, housing frame and you should be able to work out you know what length and you know what the height of the of the clothing um, you need to cut so work out you know how you're going to wrap around your um, base strap housing frame and bases before you start cutting you know to save on material because it can be quite um, costly them aesthetically quality good looking ones the fabric is stretchy so don't overly stretch them when you're sealing off the housing frame to avoid incidences of slack over time but they rarely ever do that unless you overly stretch on them okay but it's not something something to worry about and for both the top and bottom bases you know measure the length and breadth of the diagonally cut hardwood plywood so cut a square from your fabric cloth as opposed to a triangle okay so that it covers you know the entire perimeter of the top and bottom base using the length and breadth measurements from the originally obtained measurements from the diagonally cut hardwood plywood baseboards so i have pretty much replicated the process for all four base traps ensuring that the dampening fabric you know covers the base boards and the structure housing frames and so now that we've wrapped around all of the base traps the next step of the process would be to window dress all base traps and then subsequently deploy the use of a staple gun to seal off you know the dampening fabric onto the housing frame and base structures so now that we have worked out the amount of material that will cover the base structures as well as the pillar structures you know i'll start off by sealing off with a staple gun you know both top and bottom bases then engulf the material that has been um, stapled onto the top and bottom bases with the dampening fabric that covers the housing structure pillars okay then i'll staple that onto the top and bottom bases so we've got if you've got any pins that do not sit flush on the base structure, you know, get it off by all means with a staple remover and then continue to proceed with your stapling whilst ensuring no loose ends. And once you're done, you know, stapling, you know, ensure that all pins are flush with the aid of a hammer. Just give it a good definitive bang with reasonable force. The process in the aforementioned will be repeated or replicated for other base traps until all of the housing frame and base structures are sealed off. And as previously highlighted, you know, if you want to avoid receding lines, then, you know, invest more in the quality of the blade that you'd be using on your secular saw. Okay. This topic has been well broached in the video in the link in the description. So by all means, click if you're interested in finding out what type of blade um, you'd need to um, procure. And as discussed in other videos, the quality of blade and the type of material you're cutting is crucial with respect to getting fine, clean quality cuts, you know, on the um, hardwood plywood boards. Make sure that you give the dampening fabric a good, nice, clean cut fold at the corners to make it more aesthetically pleasing. And as previously highlighted, just replicate the process for other base traps. Acoustic panel fabrication or build are much suited to absorbing mid and high range frequencies, which you can find in the link in the description. Whereas the base traps being built here are much suited for low frequencies. When comparing sound absorption and soundproofing, we are looking at how different materials interact with sound wave energy. Some materials will absorb sound energy, some will reflect it and others will allow it to pass through or transmit it. Most materials do a little bit of all three depending on the sound frequency. It may work better 
on mid to high frequency or on low frequencies. Sound absorbing fabric is not soundproof as it will improve the quality of sound within a room by decreasing reverberation and echo of the sound generated in the room. And marginally decrease transmission of some frequencies between rooms. These sound absorbing fabrics can be used in homes, theatres, recording studios, restaurants and even churches. Acoustic fabrics are used for draping rooms and absorbing noise or for wrapping absorbent materials and allowing the sound through. Cloth of different weaves and densities interact with sound distinctly so select a fabric for the purpose you want. Whether you're looking at getting a sound absorbing fabric or an acoustically transparent fabric. Just take cognizance that the sound absorbing fabric ones will absorb sound frequency waves because they are thick and porous. Suffice to say, the waves enter into the fabric and become trapped in them fibres and folds and convert from sound energy into heat. Whilst them acoustically transparent fabrics are used to cover acoustic panels, bays, traps and diffusers that are made of absorbent insulation. They cover and contain the fibres of the insulation while permitting sound waves to pass through as if they weren't there. Many fabrics are transparent or made up of breathable clothing or fabric. And if you're looking, you know, to get a transparent material that, you know, is cost effective, you could use your bed sheets if you're working on a budget. To check if your fabric is transparent, hold it up to your mouth and blow through it. If the air passes easily through it, then it, it is transparent. There are different qualities of transparent or breathable materials. Look for the cloth of fabric that is strong, durable, dust and strain resistant and bespoke to the colour or pattern that you want. And if, even if it's fire rated, you know, the better. And here, the final stage assembly of all four base traps has been completed. We've got the grey acoustic dampening fabric on, you know, one base trap. And the remainder of them three have got the black acoustic dampening fabric. And the next step of the process would be to check out if the hypothesis in the design review holds out. When we stack up all them four base trap from the floor up to the ceiling. The base trap has got two sides essentially, one which is the forward facing side facing us and a right angled side that will be sat entrenched in the right angled wall profile. So hopefully it should, you know, stack up well against, you know, the right angled wall profile and um, it shouldn't wobble. As the base area profile is well spread out with, with respect to measurements. And as you can see, it just about stacks out right from the floor up to the ceiling. And you know, there isn't any right number with respect to the amount of base traps that you use, but you know, the more the better, which will significantly help with respect to low frequencies. So basically, throw in as many wedges as you can in them corners of your room to battle them low frequencies, as well as deploy the use of a diffuser. And you know, to battle them, mid frequencies and then high frequencies you could use acoustic panels and like i said previously click on the link in the description to see how to build acoustic panels and cost effective ways to set up your diffuser if you want to improve the sound in your room absorption is the way to go and if you're going to prevent sound from entering or leaving your room then soundproofing is the way to go and that's about it really. If you found the information useful, don't forget to subscribe, like and share, help the channel grow and hopefully catch up with you later.